now I'll turn it over to Francis. Good morning. Um, so the title of this panel is New Initiatives, and I think the uh, impetus for it is that although the excuse for the Dodd-Frank Act was systemic failure, its greatest impact in the future may be in the many far-reaching changes to everyday securities regulation that are either in the Act itself or implicated by the Act for future uh, action by the SEC and other regulators. Um, as you listen to our speakers this morning, I suggest that you think about a few broad issues that the Act uh, implicates. The first is the Act contemplates a tiered implementation subject to countless studies, primarily by the SEC, but also by other regulatory agencies, which one might argue uh, are calculated to confirm a certain predetermined view that's set out in the Act. Uh, a client uh, general counsel of a major bank told me recently that that institution has 50 separate committees each of which is charged with keeping up on the developments in their particular area of the Dodd-Frank Act. And so um, you can see that the clients are on, uh, uh, on the lookout for this. Certainly the practicing bar is on the lookout for this. We don't quite know how this is going to shake out. Secondly, the Act brings into sharp focus a longstanding tension that has existed between state and federal corporate law. This interplay of federalism with the balance of power arises in all aspects of the Act, from consumer protection to proxy access. This issue is already implicated in the first challenge to one of the initial rulemaking uh, initiatives by the SEC uh, relating to proxy access. And so it is going to be addressed shortly by the DC Circuit and we'll have a little bit of guidance in this area. The third issue that you might think about is that some aspects of the Act are subject to additional congressional action. So one might wonder how much of Dodd-Frank is vulnerable to any midterm realignment that occurs after the coming elections. Um, I'd like to leave you, uh, before I introduce the first speaker who, uh, is a very distinguished person and is changing his topic as we speak. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to leave you with a quote from Winston Churchill. Now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So our first speaker is David Becker. David Becker is the general counsel and senior policy director of the SEC. Um, Mr. Becker's responsibilities include advising the Commission on all regulatory and enforcement matters, representing the Commission in all appellate actions, including enforcement actions, leading all trial litigation. And he also plays, played a critical role in several landmark regulatory actions, including matters involving regulation of the accounting profession. Now, this is not the first time Mr. Becker has been the general counsel of the SEC, and between his stints in that capacity. He has practiced with the law firms of Cleary Gottlieb and uh, before that with Wilmer Cutler. And I now would like to turn this over to David Becker, whose original topic <laughs> was implementing Dodd-Frank through sensible lawyering, but I understand it's now the rebuttal of the SEC. <laughs> Well, it's actually not the rebuttal of the SEC. It is, it is my response and, and um, on all matters. Um, uh, I have to say that what you hear from me is um, uh, represent uh, my views, not necessarily the views of anyone else at the commission uh, or the commission itself. Uh, what I usually uh, say after that is, um, uh, but I'd be rather disappointed if uh, n no one other than I share these views. Um, uh, I'm, uh, this is probably less of a, a case um, uh, uh, than usual on, uh, as far as that's concerned because um, uh, to um, uh, 
make clear my personal interest, and I, and I am going to respond to uh, Professor Jones's talk. Um, uh, I do have strong views on, on this. We're talking about an agency that I uh, care about uh, uh, deeply. Um, uh, some of um, uh, Professor Jones's comments um, mentioned people who are personal friends of mine um, and in one instance uh, friends and clients um, uh, of mine. I have some knowledge about some of the things that um, she uh, spoke about, uh, uh, and I uh, and these people uh, are um, among those who do uh, 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 sincerely believe um, that our actions uh, uh, benefit uh, the public and do not subvert um, uh, uh, the public's uh, uh, business, and I do not have the view. Um, uh, that that is merely a self-serving delusion. Um, 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 uh, but I do, um, so um, uh, it, it, it way of a uh, disclaimer uh, up front, this is a matter as to which uh, uh, I feel some uh, emotional uh, investment. Um, uh, and also, um, uh, this is not gonna be uh, terribly uh, 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 well, uh, uh, organized and elegant because I is just uh, a little outline that I uh, scribbled uh, during the last uh, uh, section. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I could use, um, uh, you know, I, I, I could be sort of dismissive uh, of a lot of what I heard and, and on the uh, merits, uh, I do think it deserves a dismissal um, but there is a public purpose here as well. I am concerned that the repetition of, uh, of comments like this have a um, delegitimizing uh, effect um, uh, on the agency, a suggestion that um, uh, strengths and significant weaknesses um, uh, uh, can be reduced um, uh, uh, to um, a unified theory, um, which um, I think uh, if, if that um, uh, attitude becomes widely held, uh, I think it makes it harder for the SEC um, to do its job and to make changes um, that we have been trying to make uh, to make the SEC uh, more effective. Um, why um, uh, has the uh, SEC's uh, enforcement uh, program uh, not been as effective in some ways as it should be is a serious question. Um, and it's a serious question uh, that we have been trying uh, uh, to respond to. Um, I would suggest that the assertion that it must be the revolving door. Um, I take it. Uh, take it as an expression of faith, um, rather than um, uh, as something that involves a repetition of evidence. Um, um, uh, the only evidence I heard um, was a, um, a mention of, of some studies uh, suggesting that. Um, uh, small uh, firms uh, don't get treated as well as uh, large firms in enforcement uh, matters. Ironically, I made that point in a brief 25 uh, uh, years ago before the D.C. Circuit involving a uh, case involving uh, Blinder Robinson, who uh, it was made as a uh, the equivalent of a Hail Mary pass because if there was ever a firm that deserve to be treated bear, uh, uh, bad, badly. Uh, uh, it was blind to Robinson. Um, uh, 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 but I say that not simply not to be dismissive of that assertion. Uh, I think there can be something to that. Um, um, uh, and and I, I don't have an evidentiary 
answer to that assertion if, if it is true, but, but I don't know where one gets the leap from, oh, well, it must be because they have high-priced lawyers, and the high-priced lawyers are SEC uh, alums, and uh, uh, therefore, um, uh, 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 that must explain it. Um, my own view, to the extent that one finds a disparity on the enforcement uh, side, and I don't know whether it is still true or not, is um, um, uh, it, it is that it has to do th uh, with the assumption that respectable institutions are respectable. Um, um, it, it, it's not a mechanical answer, for example, but my guess is, it's just guess, it's not, I don't have a microscope that lets me prove this, is that um, uh, the reason Madoff got away with what he did is because it was literally inconceivable um, uh, for a guy with a firm that seemed to have that type of business on that scale that all it was was a Ponzi scheme. Um, and uh, the SEC is to be criticized for not having conceived of the inconceivable, that's what we're supposed to do, particularly when it's laid out in front of you. Um, um, but um, I, 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 my, my guess is, is that that explains to the extent there are concerns about uh, uh, disparities. Now, there's an illogic to um, uh, a, a lot of these assertions. You, you say, okay, um, uh, uh, Linda Thompson took Mary Jo White's call, um, um, and that must be because Linda Thompson somehow had it in her head, and maybe she um, didn't know it, that she wanted to be, um, uh, you know, in, in Mary Jo White's uh, good graces because someday she'd be looking at a job. And that's why senior officials are too ready to um, uh, uh, reverse the, uh, um, the uh, recommendations of junior officials. Well, it's not the senior officials who have to worry about what their next job is. Um, for better or for worse, um, uh, uh, that the director of enforcement, you know, you get a new uh, a director on the f of enforcement uh, leaves the SEC every five years or so. I guarantee you, the director, an outgoing director of enforcement, does not lack for suitors. Um, indeed. If you do, it, to the extent that one should worry about revolving doors, where you should worry is with the people who join the SEC after three years and decide for some incomprehensible reason they hate law firm life and, um, uh, and, and, and then spend three or four years in the SEC and, and uh, then go out. Those are the ones whose title doesn't necessarily give them an automatic uh, a, a job. Um, the business about, um, first of all, let, let's talk about Aguirre for uh, a minute. I'm extremely familiar with the Aguirre case. Both sides asked me to represent them in the Aguirre case. I ended up representing um, uh, a, a one of the former staff people. Um, um, as to the point about Linda Thompson should not have taken Mary Jo White's call, among other things, I would suggest to you that what supervisors can do is, um, uh, uh, is supervise, uh, take a level of judgment and experience that, and, and breadth of, of uh, 
agency perspective that the more junior people are not supposed to have and often do not have. Um, um, uh, um, and um, I, there's nothing inherently nefarious of a senior official making it clear to the world, you have problems with what we're doing here. Call me. You think that uh, we're abusing your client? Uh, call me. Um, um, I'm, you know, I, you can reach me. Um, and that senior official is not going to be, particularly at a place with the culture of the SEC, um, is not going to be in the business of simply pulling the plug on an investigation because I've gotten a call from Mary Jo White. In the Aguirre situation, there is no evidence. I, I, I'm not even talking about evidence from which um, uh, you can draw separate inferences. There's no evidence that Linda Thompson said to anybody, we, um, uh, we got to make sure that Mac doesn't testify here, or I don't think um, uh, he should testify here. The call was only about whether Morgan Stanley should hire Mac not about how he should be treated in, in his in investigation. There is, repeat, no evidence that anything that Linda Thompson did affected the, um, uh, 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 the course of the investigation. There's a Geary's allegation to that effect, backed up by nothing, two Inspector General uh, 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 reports um, found no evidence of wrongdoing here. Um, uh, and, and there, there was some concern uh, in the second in Inspector General report that uh, Aguirre wasn't terminated in the right way, but no evidence that an, any senior uh, intervention in the investigation. And why would there be, again, um, uh, uh, the call to uh, Linda Thompson was only, can we hire this guy? Now, the smoke and fire point, I don't remember exactly what, I, I do remember that phrase from Danalo's notes. I don't know whether that's in Danalo's notes or just in um, uh, uh, Linda's transcript, but what she said was, we're still in the early stages. And I can tell you as of now, all I can tell you as of now is there's lots of smoke, but no fire. So she's not giving him uh, information about um, uh, uh, what's there in the investigation, and she's certainly not giving him a commitment giving her a commitment about what the SEC is going to do uh, uh, going forward. Um, uh, there are all, now, there are all these assertions in the report by Senators Grassley and um, Specter, but they are unsupported by um, um, uh, evidence and I, uh, having taken a client in to be interviewed by those staff, I can tell you that those interviews um, uh, were, I'll put it this way, I, uh, they're not like any other government investigation I've uh, been involved in, in terms of reflecting a sincere uh, search for the truth as opposed to producing something that would play in the press. Uh, but, you know, politicians are politicians. That's what they do. Um, my, my biggest problem with this revolving door uh, analysis is that it is completely reductionist. 
Um, it, it has a, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's sort of, is in essence, a reductionist view of causation. X happens, uh, and look, um, uh, Y happened at the same time. It must be because uh, Y being the revolving door, this wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, uh, I, as, as it assumes that all actions are explainable by this, it assumes that all SEC um, um, former employees or soon to be former employees are the same. Um, um, and, it, and it assumes that humans act, you know, it's just a, um, a, a sort of, um, uh, we're not independent moral agents, but we're rather um, um, uh, uh, the sum of uh, certain influences uh, up, upon us. I, I, I share this view, I believe, with all the SEC legal staff. I'm a lawyer. I represent clients. My duty is to represent whatever client I have to the best of my ability, to the best of that client's interest. It's sort of the legal version of love the one you're with. Um, <laughs> I know what it means for other people to be lawyers. I do know that. Um, um, but that guides what I do. Even when I do it with my friends. I have a very close professional and personal friend who came in, a couple of them, a, a, a little while ago, um, uh, to talk to me about uh, something that uh, their client wanted. Uh, it was preposterous. Um, um, and here's the special favor they got from me. Rather than lecture them, I simply laughed and said, you know better than that. That's it. Now, is there another side of the equation? I, I think there is. Um, uh, look, you do, um, wh when you're an SEC alum, particularly someone who's high level, certainly your clients think you have uh, a certain degree of influence, and I have told them, as I was trained 30 years ago by other SEC alums, and I have told them this, what you're getting from me is good lawyering. I'm not in the influence business. So if you think you, if that's what you want, you ought to go someplace else. Um, so, um, uh, but in truth, People who I know, not because they want to um, come to my law firm, but people who I know um, and who have a view of me that arises from my conduct when I was their colleague, that's generally, if, it, if it's a positive view, they will return my call. And other people who don't have that history, they might not return their call. Um, but they don't do anything for me that they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, uh, you talk to people in the private enforcement bar, uh, as I do a lot because I was a member of the <laughs> private enforcement bar, and the thing you hear more than anything else is frustration. People say we're in the hospice business. Um, we're just leading clients we try and get something for them, but we have uh, a, a, a minimal influence. And I can tell you, my own experience is people don't treat you any better on the enforcement staff. They don't, um, and, and they certainly don't do anything for you. And I wouldn't want them to, but I, I you know, I want them to in the sense that I urge them to, <coughs> but I, you know, that's not the game. It's not what it is. Um, last point. Um, here, here's what you do, and, and I made this point, ironically, last week in a 
speech to some senior general counsels. What you're able to do, because having been at the SEC, is you explain, you, you act as an interpreter. You know, when, when you represent a client with a government agency, you try and interpret, you try and explain how the world looks to your client. That's the, that's, you know, an effective form of advocacy. What you are, what you try and do in the private sector, having been at the SEC, you act as an interpreter. You say, yes, I've been at uh, a planet government. Um, I lived among them for a while. <laughs> I know their language. <laughs> I know what, uh, 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 what leads them to do what they do. Um, I think that's useful. I think that's an example, and I do spend a certain amount of my time thinking about whether I do is socially useful. And, and I think, having been at the SEC, having seen the focus for, on the public interest, and having a sense of uh, needing to be true to my professionalism and my own personal values, I think I do some good when I go back into the private sector and say, here's what you're supposed to do and why you're supposed to do it. So uh, I've gone on too long already, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annette Nazareth. Um, Ms. Nazareth was uh, a commissioner of the SEC uh, before she took her current position, which is as a partner at Davis, Polk, and Wardell. Uh, and before becoming an SEC commissioner in 2005, Ms. Nazareth held a number of positions, including uh, as the director of the Division of Market Regulation, for the SEC, which is now known as the Division of Trading and Markets. Um, during her tenure at the Commission, Ms. Nazareth worked on numerous groundbreaking initiatives, including execution quality disclosure rules, implementation of equities, decimal pricing, short sale reforms, and modernization of the national market system rules. Today, she's going to speak to us on how the Dodd-Frank Act affects the securities business. Thank you. I was going to ask how David really feels, but, um, <laughs> you know, just to give you a, a little personal anecdote, I mean, I joined the government in um, 1998. I was actually received a cold call from Arthur Levitt, um, who called me when I was in the securities industry and was looking to bring people uh, down to Washington who had industry experience. And I figured, well, I'd, I better go. You don't turn down lunch with the SEC chairman, but I had really very little interest in serving in the government. And he had me come to his office, and I had lunch in his office, and um, lunch was served at a table that was under this gigantic American flag. And he really spent about an hour talking about patriotism and how important it was to give back to your government. And I think that really uh, influenced me a great deal. I ended up giving far more time to the government than I ever imagined. It was almost a decade. And I just really want you to understand the level of commitment that a lot of people at the SEC have. So um, I obviously agree with David. I also think that it is extremely important to emphasize how much we all have to value integrity in the government. So we're not in any way minimizing the importance of being vigilant about government integrity. Um, and, you know, we have to get to the bottom of any wrongdoing if that exists. But um, I guess what concerns me, particularly in light of what my uh, talk is today, which is about the Dodd-Frank Act and the tremendous way that it's going to impact uh, the securities business and the huge um, uh, challenges with implementation of that act, it's so important that um, we sort of cut through the cynicism that exists, particularly in, in light of the financial crisis, and that we uh, 
be able to attract uh, very able people to work in the government because frankly with almost 250 rulemaking, 67 studies, you know, the biggest uh, change in, in financial regulation since the, the 1930s, how is this going to get done unless we are able to attract and, and retain, at least for a time, really knowledgeable people who understand how these markets work? Um, I think we have a, a system in this country that's obviously quite different than what we have in in other places like the UK where you have sort of a civil service that you know, seems to uh, serve in the government for life. I think there are benefits. Obviously we need to address any of the, of the challenges, but there are real benefits to people, I don't like to use the term revolving door, people who are willing to give of their time at an important point in their career to basically contribute a number of years to the government. Um, you know, in order to sort of, you know, serve our marketplace. So, you know, that may sound um, a little pie in the sky, but I really do think that, that there is a benefit to this system and that we should uh, uh, seek to make the best of it. And, and, and that, that certainly doesn't mean, you know, putting our heads in the sand. So as I said, this um, Dodd-Frank Act has had, you know, is, is going to affect virtually um, uh, all levels of, um, and all areas of the financial markets. Um, clearly, it did, did not just address the very important things that you heard about earlier, like systemic risk. It, um, given the number of pages, it clearly um, seemed to follow the model of financial crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And we will use this as an opportunity <laughs> to, to basically regulate in all areas anything that, that might be helpful. This is, uh, and, and anything that we've been looking to do for years that have been unsuccessful in addressing uh, all are in this bill. Um, when you think about how, for instance, and, and we had, had heard something about this before, when you think about the swaps markets, you know, the, where, where you had, you know, trillions of dollars in notional transactions, a completely unregulated market. And, and remember, it wasn't unregulated because nobody thought about it. It was aggressively unregulated in 1999 with the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. The SEC was essentially told, you may not touch this. And I was personally, and I, I claim credit for this, personally the one who, you know, fought for the little provision that the SEC got in that bill that said, if there is fraud in a securities-based swap, the SEC can go after it. Now, did, did that make me sleep well nights? No, because there was no way to find fraud, unless someone literally came and knocked on our doors and said, here it is, there's fraud in the trading of, the, uh, you know, in, in this transaction. There was no way to find it. There was no trade reporting. There was no, nothing to look at, right? So, um, but in any case, at least the SEC had anti-fraud authority. Now we see the exact opposite. What we're seeing is an imposition on this market of regulation akin to what you see in the equities market. So imagine all the things that you take for granted today, right? Trade reporting brokers and dealers who are regulated, um, exchanges, clearinghouses, the things that you heard on the last panel. None of these things existed for this market. And so Congress now, being very um, impatient with the current state of affairs, has now put deadlines on all these things that are really mind-boggling when you think about the infrastructure that exists in our, in our equity markets that is intended in some way to be replicated. And when you think about, and, and I think they did this properly, I mean, they came up with, you know, generally broad definitions, but when you actually try to figure out what do those words mean? What does it mean to be a swap ex execution facility? What, what, what kinds of trading facilities will satisfy that requirement? What will, what will registering as one of those mean? What will the capital requirements be, as, as was suggested before? What will the, um, margin requirements be. Um, all of these things uh, require tremendous amounts of judgment, but also, as you can imagine, negotiation, uh, drafting skills, um, all manner of, of talent that uh, is going to have to be brought to bear to basically build an infrastructure that currently does not exist in, in a market that um, 
I don't believe is going away anytime soon. So, um, and, it, and it will have profound impacts on what happens in the future. I do believe that there is a tremendous amount of concern that if we get it wrong, particularly in the clearinghouse space, that all we've done is now concentrate the risk. I mean, it, it, I, you know, sort of pause when I hear people like Pat Parkinson at the Fed, who's now in charge of, you know, supervision and regulation, a long time, very knowledgeable Fed economist and very thoughtful person who himself has said he worries about this as an issue because while we look to the experience of clearing houses, which has been very positive, we haven't had any of these clearing houses fail. We've had a few uh, scary moments uh, over the course of time, but generally they have functioned very well. But they've never had the kind of risky um, and more bespoke types of, um, of products run through those systems. And so what does that mean? It, it again, relies on the fact that we, we somehow are, are putting a very high premium on regulation. As much as we've criticized all the regulation of the past, we seem to want more. We want to be better. We want regulators to be smarter, certainly have a lot of integrity. That's key. It's got to be built on a good foundation. But we're putting a huge amount of emphasis on, on getting this right, and um, that is going to be, you know, a tremendous, a tremendous challenge. So, um, again, that is something that we're, we're relying on, on uh, the regulatory agencies to do. In addition, um, we're going to have trade execution requirements. Again, think about, we talked about transparency and would it help if we had better information? Well, certainly I think it will help if there is better transparency around um, around derivatives and particularly the pricing. Um, and so I think there will be a lot more trade information. I suspect what's going to happen as a result, just as we saw happened in the fixed income markets when uh, we put the trace system in effect, and I still have the bruises from that one, the, the, uh, the spreads in, in that market were reduced by 75% in the course of a year. Um, that's, you know, very good for the investing public, doesn't make you really popular with the dealers. Well, that's what's going to happen here. I mean, I think the, the tremendous uh, profits that have been enjoyed in this market are going to uh, be, you know, narrowed quite substantially because now everybody's going to know what the prices are. And in addition, the number of players, I think, will increase very substantially because, in my view, the market structure was that because you were taking the risk of your counterparty and you didn't have a you know, central clearinghouse that was basically innovating and becoming your counterparty, you really were trading on the basis of a balance sheet of a very large, well-capitalized dealer. Now I think you'll get more players who can come into this space because you'll be very quickly um, you know, taking on the risk of the, the clearinghouse as opposed to uh, the counterparty for an extended period of time. So, again, I think we're going to see very big changes in that area. Likewise, um, Congress saw fit to impose business conduct uh, requirements. Didn't say what they would be, but said that um, the regulators are going to have to start now imposing business conduct rules, just as you see, again, in the, in the securities markets, in the swaps markets. And they have also seen fit to say that for certain types of counterparties, special entities like municipalities and pension funds, endowments and the like, there probably should be heightened standards. Um, so again, lots, lots of changes. This is going to be a sea change in, in the, the marketplace. Interestingly, and I, I thought it was um, funny that the references were made to what the arguments are going to be on, on competitiveness in the U.S. markets. I mean, you had to have been a regulator in the last decade to appreciate the changes that we've seen. I mean, when David was at the SEC the first time, we, you know, we would get hauled up to Congress and berated for being overly regulatory. And, um, you know, you see even today, the SEC is continuously having their rules struck down uh, by the courts. Um, the hedge fund advisors, the, you know, when Chairman Donaldson was at the SEC, there was an attempt to take this sort of opaque area um, of our marketplace and put a little more sunshine in it. And, and there was an attempt to um, have hedge fund advisors merely register. It wasn't going to be some sort of pervasive regulatory approach. Let's just figure out who they are, what they're doing, do they have compliance procedures, you know. It, it really was almost like a 
census, what, uh, the rule that was um, put in place by the SEC. As you know, it was struck down in the Goldstein case. Well, now Congress thought, obviously, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So what they did in the Dodd-Frank Act, Act was essentially reverse uh, what the D.C. Circuit did in the Goldstein case and now uh, require that hedge fund advisors uh, be registered really in a manner that was quite similar to what the SEC <coughs> had attempted to put in place several years ago. Um, there's also going to be a lot of changes um, in terms of investor protections. I mean, you, there's, as you probably know, um, a study that the SEC was required under the Act to engage in um, with respect to fiduciary duty standards and, and trying to um, analyze whether the standards that apply to um, personalized investment advice that is given to retail investors, whether the standard of care should be the same uh, on the broker-dealer side as the advisor side. Uh, not surprisingly, that is a concept that is, um, uh, has been very troubling historically to the, the brokerage industry. Um, I think they certainly felt, uh, have argued all along, that they thought the suitability standard was uh, comparable to the fiduciary standard uh, may not have been identical, but was uh, good enough. I think uh, the writing, David won't tell me for sure, but I'm sure the writing is if on the wall. If you offer me a job, yeah, I right. will. <laughs> <laughs> the, writing, uh, the writing seems to be on the wall that the um, SEC is certainly going to um, determine in their study that the, uh, the standards of care should be the same, that retail investors should not have to understand in what capacity you're acting in order to know what protections they get. They shouldn't have to have a law degree to know whether you're wearing your advisor hat or your broker hat and what that means in terms of their advice. Um, and so I think the, my sense is that the brokerage industry has sort of um, embraced this and now sort of said not, are you going to impose the fiduciary duty, but how is it that we're going to be able to, what they're saying, operationalize this? How are we going to be able to do this in a context in which we have full-service firms, full-service broker-dealers, where sometimes we are acting as a principal. All the business is not agency. Sometimes if you want to buy an IPO from us and we're, we're a principal, that's a violation of a fiduciary duty in the absence of adequate disclosure and consent. Sounds easy, but how are you going to do that with all the millions of transactions that occur? So I think that's now, uh, the good news is that's now, the, I think, the level of conversation with the regulators, not don't come out with a study that says that we have to raise the um, standard of care, but how can we do that and not have to stop offering the full range of products and services that, that customers um, receive today. So again, I think that's going to be a very, very uh, big change and hopefully you know, a positive one on the investing public. Um, likewise, I think the SEC now has authority to um, to require point of sale disclosure, and I suspect if they ever get around to it, uh, they will do that. I mean, I think that when you really look at the um, disclosures, I mean, we talked earlier again about transparency. Transparency is great, but it, in a sense, it's a word. It's like wh when you talk about uh, disclosure, there's no shortage of disclosure. The, the shortage is of absorbable information on which people can behave rationally. And I think the SEC's challenge, and it's going to be difficult in the near term with all their other implementation issues, but they're really going to have to find a way, perhaps through um, uh, uh, intranet uh, means or whatever, to, to, to provide information to people in a manner that they can absorb it. And maybe what that means is that you have the same kinds of disclosures you have today, you know, the full range of disclosures, but have it sort of be almost on a click-through basis. What do I, you know, what's the cliff note version I need to know if that's all I want? But if I want to go straight through and keep getting more and more data until literally I have what would be the equivalent of what an analyst on Wall Street would want, I can have that too. But something that, you know, makes it um, informative as opposed to just uh, straight disclosure. Um, other things that uh, I think will, uh, you know, be of the sort of interest, again, more than uh, just on Wall Street, are things like, um, you know, the changes in executive compensation and, and corporate governance changes. 
Um, you know, as you probably know, there are now independence requirements for compensation uh, committees of boards. Um, and, uh, you know, that clearly is a reaction to the fact that uh, there's a sense that um, that pay was, you know, too high in a lot of um, in a lot of instances and that boards were not sensitive enough to those issues. Um, some of the uh, pay and performance disclosures, um, again, I find a little amusing in the sense that it's it's more again, it's just more disclosure. Is it actually going to uh, impact behavior? I'm not so sure. I remember years ago. Dick Grasso saying that, you know, the more, uh, and you haven't heard his name in a while, right? The, the more you disclose compensation, the more you get a raise to the top. Um, and so you do have this odd dynamic where instead of it um, actually being a limiter or imposing some discipline, everybody, nobody wants their CEO to be the lowest. Everybody wants to be average, and the average, it's like Lake Wobegon effect, except the whole average keeps moving up. Um, Likewise, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, new disclosure requirement that I guess the SEC will have to uh, do rulemaking on that says that you're going to have what's called an internal pay equity disclosure. It's going to be, you have to say, well, what's the median annual compensation of all employees in the company? And then what is the total annual compensation of the CEO? And then what's the ratio of the median employee total comp to that of the CEO? So, Interestingly, whoever drafted this wasn't thinking about doing it in the most in the way that would have the most um, logical impact. So instead of saying, "Well, the CEO makes eight times what the normal person makes," it's that the normal person makes point oh oh oh. You know, it's like it just doesn't have the same. It's it's the classic. You know, it, the math works, but the the I don't know. Maybe David, you'll be able to, to find a way to do this in a way that has greater impact. But um, it, it's going to be like a it's going to be a fraction. It's sort of hard to get people excited about fractions. Maybe it's just <laughs> um, uh, As you know, also, the, um, the act requires uh, things for like votes on say on pay and uh, say on golden parachutes, clawback provisions that I think will, uh, you talked earlier about, you know, how do you incent CEOs? Well, one of the, one of the provisions here I think that will get people very nervous are the clawback provisions which um, uh, seem to be, I think, more rigorous than what was in Sarbanes-Oxley in that it, it mandates, uh, um, you know, clawbacks when there are errors, uh, that, that's going back and taking back uh, pay, um, when there are errors in financial statements, whether or not the senior executive had any knowledge of it or any uh, complicity in the error. So that seemed, again, um, somewhat punitive. Um, and I guess I'd like to say, uh, finally, um, you know, there are whistleblower provisions, I think, that are, uh, I haven't been following this as much as some of my partners, but uh, I think that are uh, causing great concern in, uh, in corporate America on boards because, again, it's one of these things where, um, you know, the thought was, well, we want to we wanna get all these people snitching on each other and that that's a good thing, you know, and, and we want to reward them want to get at the root of all this, uh, uh, all this crime that's going on. So we will um, increase the circumstances in which wh whistleblowers can uh, be rewarded. It used to be that it was 10%, um, I guess, of what the penalty was. It was discretionary, and it only applied in insider trading cases. So that was the, to provide incentives for whistleblowing and insider trading. Now it's between 10 and 30% of the sanctions. Um, and um, I guess it's, it's mandatory in those cases where the person really provided sort of original um, information. Um, and it's uh, in, in all cases where I think the penalty is a million dollars or more. Well, I think one of the problems here is that you've got a lot of, um, you know, legitimate operations that are wondering, well, how are we going to compete? with this whistleblower statute. So in other words, if you tell all your employees, look, if you see anything going on here that's inappropriate, we want you to tell us. I mean, a lot of firms under Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, they put these whistleblower policies into effect. I know I'm on a board that just did that as well. And, um, and so you want to encourage your employees to, you know, let's not let things fester, report what's going on so we can fix it. 
Well, now you've created a financial incentive for people not to tell you because under this statute, they'd get a minimum of $100,000 if the penalty is a million dollars. So uh, one of the things I think that people are hoping, again, I'm lobbying David here from the podium, is that maybe the SEC can find ways to work through those perverse incentives and even, even say, for instance, if there's some other uh, you know, way for people to be rewarded, you know, if, if ultimately there's an issue, but that they, um, that there's an attempt at least to, um, uh, to report up through their companies so that you get good governance right at, at, in the first instance as opposed to waiting till something becomes uh, a colossal mistake. So anyway, those are just a few of the um, things I think that are going to have a, an impact on, on the markets and on the securities business. And uh, uh, there are obviously many more because the bill goes on for over 1,000 pages. But those are the ones I thought I'd highlight today. Our last speaker this morning is uh, Professor J.W. Verrett. He is an assistant professor at George Mason University School of Law. And uh, Professor Verrett has written extensively on corporate law topics and has uh, co-authored with uh, Chief Justice Myron Steele of the Delaware Supreme Court uh, on his, uh, one of his latest articles. Um, Professor Verrett is a child of his times, apparently, since he has a, an illustrious uh, track record of appearing on uh, television newscasts and programs, and he also is active uh, as an invited commentator in a number of corporate governance and financial blogs. And Professor Verrett is going to talk to us today about defenses to shareholder proxy access. Thanks, and thanks to George for um, <clears throat> and all the folks at the at the uh, center and Jonathan Adler for putting together this panel and uh, inv inviting us. Um, <clears throat> George, if the uh, if the, the topic of the if the title for the previous discussion, the previous part of the panel was the SEC strikes back, I hope I can sort of self-title my part of it, the return of Delaware, um, because I, I I like to try to try to hopefully one day um, think I will be. A, uh, a Jedi in the Delaware corporate code, like my master before me. Um, and so my topic today is proxy access. It's one of the strongest um, um, uh, attempts at preemption of state corporate law that's contained in the Dodd-Frank bill and that was promulgated a few weeks ago by the SEC and that has since been stayed by the commission in light of a challenge from the Chamber of Commerce. And so I'm glad the SEC has, you know, stayed implementation of the, of the Dodd-Frank bill to give me more, to, of proxy access, to give me more time to work on defenses to uh, proxy access. And, and um, so it, it, what is proxy access? Just to summarize it generally, it's a, a mechanism to provide shareholders the right to put nominees on the corporate ballot rather than have to fund their own nominees, which they're still able to do in solicitations, to put new members on the board. The SEC's current rule limits the application to owners of 3%. Uh, of a company's securities and uh, who also hold those securities for three years, uh, uh, voting, voting common stock for three years. It does not permit opt-out and it does not permit shareholders or, the, or companies to uh, opt out of the rule. So my uh, uh, interest is in, in, in this paper um, that, I'm, that, I'm, that is the focus of my discussion is to develop defenses to proxy access and to justify those defenses and to discuss how I think they will be reviewed uh, in the Delaware Court of Chancery. Um, I uh, have started to get a little bit of, of discussion about my defenses and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, frankly, it's tough to find a friend at this point because uh, the Council of Institutional Investors sent a special corporate governance alert and said to their pension fund members and said, look out for this crazy guy from George Mason who's developing all these defenses to proxy access when the rule hasn't even been promulgated yet, so keep an eye on him. Which I, you know, I appreciate the press as long as you still spell my name, spell my name right. I, I, I love it. The latest Wachtell Lipton memo about proxy access refers to my defenses and says um, we don't advocate using them at this point, um, which is rather ironic for a Wachtell Lipton not to advocate using, uh, you know, strong defenses, uh, board defenses. We don't advocate it at this point. Instead, we encourage um, uh, engagement with shareholders, appeasement, and if history is any judge, I think. Uh, that they'll eventually change their tune on that uh, on that position. 
Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm developing defenses. I think many of them will be useful. A couple of them are going to be implemented at a couple of Fortune 50 uh, companies uh, this year into their bylaws. And so um, I think it's coming, and I think that, that my work is something you'll, whether you like it or not, uh, hopefully you'll have to deal with. Um, so the latest debate over proxy access was between, uh, uh, and I think the most applicable was between Bebchuk and Grunfest over the question of opt-out versus opt-in. And even, uh, you know, Bebchuk, as strong a supporter as he is of pro uh, proxy access, supported the notion of opt-out in a very limited range of circumstances and requiring shareholder approval, uh, but nevertheless supportive of opt-out. And the commission opted, uh, uh, or the commission opted chose, out. Uh, opted out of opt-out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I think my defense has presented an opportunity to opt out and present an, uh, a negotiating space to opt back in if boards and shareholders decide to do so. The evidence uh, and I think the support for this endeavor is both, uh, I think I can feel comfortable relying on the institutional literature that looks at the uh, conflicts of particular shareholders. And the, I think the, the boogeyman here is union pension funds and uh, state pension funds, of course, that uh, represent the potential for significant conflicts. There's a very limited empirical literature about uh, proxy access in particular. Uh, and I think one of the problems with the SEC's rule proposal uh, and, and the rule that they adopted was that they relied on, on uh, a lot of analogy to analysis about entrenchment generally and about other devices that uh, some folks argue uh, result in entrenchment, but uh, very little support for the idea that this proxy access rule was the solution to that entrenchment. And in fact, to the extent there's an empirical literature on this, uh, Aeol and Kim and uh, other, um, uh, other studies funded by the Rock Center uh, look at uh, abnormal st uh, um, uh, stock price returns to announcements about a proxy access rule. Uh, and so I think there's some reason for skepticism there. And also I think um, uh, part of my concern uh, is the fact that proxy access, of course, um, represents a possibility of preemption of, of uh, state law governance of the voting, the actual substance rather than the disclosure of the voting process. So what are these uh, defenses? Well, I, I analyze a number of them in the paper. Some of them are, are certainly not my own invention. They were, uh, uh, they were concepts that have been around for a long time that I try to think about uh, possible application to this unique set of circumstances. Um, uh, the, the nomination of a uh, minority slate uh, rather than a proxy uh, fight uh, in, through which a, uh, a shareholder attempts to acquire control. So poison pills and golden parachutes, tin parachutes, proxy puts are all uh, existing mechanisms that I think are worth considering in this circumstance. Also, I should note too about unique about the SEC's rule is that you have to certify that you have no control intent and you can only get up to uh, you know minority position on the board and so uh, it can't be used to facilitate uh, acquisition of control. Uh, some of the ones that I, I, I think are uh, unique to this paper are first, uh, it's very important to uh, members of the board to obtain insurance, DNO insurance coverage and indemnification. I say why not uh, deny the uh, uh, insurgents either one of those benefits and have them uh, self-fund for that. Um, secondly, uh, boards have the authority to delegate uh, decisions to committees. Now, not all decisions, of course. Major transactions that require amendment to the charter uh, may not be delegated to committee, so M&A approval may not be delegated, but most day-to-day -day decisions and even some very large decisions can be delegated. Why not um, uh, uh, keep the insurgents off of that uh, committee of the board and uh, keep them out of the deliberations of that committee? Director qualification bylaws. Now, I think this is the defense that's most likely to be instituted, and it's one that a couple of big companies are going to institute very soon. Um, I, now, I didn't invent this. I, I, I just uh, note that it's a little-known provision of the Delaware General Corporation law that was unused un, 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 um, until, I think, now, uh, very rarely used, because it would represent, uh, prior to a post-Dodd-Frank world, uh, a board self-limiting its own ability to recruit directors, and so it was very rarely used. To the extent it was ever used, it was typically a result of defense contractors uh, for whom uh, the government uh, required those defense contractors to have qualification requirements in their, uh, in their bylaws uh, relating to, you know, we don't want someone getting access to sensitive material through the board, uh, things like that. But I think director qualification bylaws can also represent a defense. Um, 
particularly if they're crafted so that they leave the board room uh, discretion, right? Uh, so the director would need to have experience at a comparable company for a substantial period of time that's in a, a comparable industry. And we allow the board of directors to interpret whether or not that has been met. Um, the director qualification bylaw can serve a very important and useful defensive function to the potential costs of conflicted shareholders obtaining representation on the board. Um, now, of course, every deci that decision, uh, whether or not to disqualify an elected director um, because of a, of a qualification requirement, would be reviewed in the Court of Chancery, just like any other decision of the board. And merely because you have the legal authority to do something doesn't mean that you can not violate your fiduciary duties in doing so. I think one of the mechanisms I would recommend, uh, at least for staggered boards, would be to uh, delegate that decision to a committee of the board consisting of directors that were not up for an election that year. As this would be, of course, this wouldn't be workable for a non-staggered board because all of the directors would be up at that time. But with a staggered board, you could say that the uh, uh, directors on that committee were independent of this decision and were not challenged by the insurgents. And so I think you could obtain some deferential treatment to that decision uh, by, the, by the committee to disqualify an elected director from service on the board. Irrevocable resignation policies. Um, the, uh, the Delaware General Corporation law was amended to accommodate majority voting specifically and allow irrevocable uh, 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 resignation policies. I think this will be more difficult to implement. So the, the three I've mentioned thus far, I think, are, are, are uh, the ones in which I am most confident will survive chancery review and I think provide the most strategic significance. I'm going to start going more to the so sort of academic side of you know, experimental ideas, uh, but I get to do that because that's my job. Um, some of my ideas, frankly, are patently, I think, illegal under the DGCL, but might be a venue for amendment to the DGCL, so it's worth talking about. I don't know, it just adds more meat to the article and uh, maybe people will cite me more often. Um, incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, be out in the Journal of Corporation Law in just a few months, so you know, if you, whether you like it or not, just be, be sure to cite it. Um, irrevocable resignation policies, I think, could arguably fit under that amendment, uh, under that majority voting uh, accommodation amendment. I don't know whether or not the Chancery Court would uh, hold such, a, such a, um, uh, uh, a resignation policy as irrevocable if the directors just uh, sort of decided to cave, right? I doubt they would enforce the irre irrevocability. So it would depend on the, the, the directors at least to be able to signal that they would be willing to resign in the event an insurgent was victorious. Um, I don't know whether or not they would be willing to, to, to be able to represent that, but at least it's worth thinking about. Permanently appointed directors, um, so uh, you would permanently appoint a minority of the board, and they would be appointed by a majority of the board that were themselves elected. Um, I think probably, given a lot of dicta from, from Vice Chancellor Strine about uh, four less uh, restrictive provisions, uh, I think he would be very suspicious, and the rest of the Court of Chancellor would be very suspicious of that, but worth considering at least. Contingent dividends, dividends contingent upon receiving uh, upon directors uh, being elected who were all, only who were uh, approved by the nominating committee of the board. Um, uh, you might ask, does this represent vote buying? I don't think so, because the vote buying cases in Delaware focus on uh, treating one group of shareholders uh, especially from the other. So an offer to all shareholders um, might not uh, face vote buying scrutiny. And, and ultimately, I don't think it has a fraudulent purpose in mind. Um, now, certainly, you know, boards have lots of reasons to issue dividends other than uh, defending against this problem. And so they might worry that if they really made the dividend contingent, then they wouldn't be able to do so and get the benefits to, 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 to their share price that they wanted. But then again, if you think about it, if the defense is really uh, 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 able to, to ward off a uh, challenge, then you never actually have to exercise the contingent nature of the dividend. So you wouldn't have a cost to capital from making it contingent if it's truly, uh, you know, if, if it's truly defensive. Um, so that would depend upon the, 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 the probability that it would need to actually be executed. You could do targeted share issuances. This might face a little bit of trouble in Delaware um, and uh, from the commission, but, you know, technically, uh, te so, so I don't want to warrant that. I don't want to advise boards to implement it yet, but I, I want to start the conversation about it. Uh, and this is kind of a sneaky trick, too, but I think it's clever, so I want to talk about it. Uh, so you have to have a 3% ownership requirement for three years. So what if you do these targeted micro issuances to make sure that, that uh, nominating shareholders lose their ability to meet that requirement? Um, election expense bonds. So the CA versus AFSCME case focused on um, uh, 
reimbursement for shareholders who challenge, bylaws that would reimburse shareholders. So uh, what about um, if, to the extent some of my defenses are, are, are permitted, right? What about if boards said, well, we'll actually rescind that defense if you're willing to post an election expense bond and pay us back for the costs of our, uh, you know, for the cost of, of, of putting you on our, on our corporate proxy. Um, I think one of the benefits that does is the presence of such, a, such an offer that will rescind our defenses would change Chancery Court review of those defenses itself, because the board would say, well, look, we didn't have a, a pure entrenchment purpose. We were worried about the cost, and so we offered them to uh, rescind our defenses if they were willing to post an election expense bond. Um, Conflicted shareholder uh, charter amendments to limit the voting rights of conflicted shareholders. Again, probably one of those that is patently illegal, uh, but uh, worth uh, considering at least in part. If you could get it through shareholder approval and amend the charter, uh, not necessarily patently illegal, but that would be fairly difficult to do, right, to limit the voting rights of conflicted shareholders. And finally, um, um, green mail, uh, right, is not permitted. Uh, uh, you, at least you can't sort of do green mail on, a, on an exchange uh, transaction. And then the IRS excise tax on green mail has led it to be a defense that's not used. Um, if you pay someone to go away for, a, for a, a, a proxy access nomination, of course, the IRS uh, excise tax on green mail wouldn't apply. Um, and, and you'd still have to do it off exchange, and you'd have to have some kind of a side payment. But uh, it wouldn't re really be green mail there, and I want to catch on the idea uh, to the, the, the phrase, it, we'd call it white mail because it would be about a nomination to the white proxy card rather than using a green proxy card. Um, we'll see if people actually use it, but I think technically it's possible. Um, so again, Arlen and Tally talk about embedded defenses like proxy puts uh, and golden and ten parachutes. I think that you can, you can at least try to make them contingent upon acquisition of a minority interest rather than majority control. And finally, we think about the poison pill, and there are a lot of recent cases that are relevant here. The Selectica case uh, deals with a low trigger pill, 4.99% trigger pill. Um, if you can technically uh, uh, you know, do a 3% trigger pill, then nobody can actually acquire interest sufficient to uh, nominate. Um, now, you know, Selectica has to be kept very closely to its facts, and so you can't, uh, Selectica was about uh, you know, an acquisition that would destroy the value of a net operating loss. Um, one of the things I think perhaps you could do to implement a low trigger pill would be to say, okay, the pill is low trigger, except, except if you, um, you know, somehow agree that you're not going to exercise your federal proxy access nomination right, at which case it goes back to a 15% trigger pill that we usually have, right? Um, Barnes & Noble permits grouping shareholders together to determine uh, whether or not a pill uh, uh, limit has been triggered, um, the Barnes & Noble case, and so that would be, definitely be um, uh, relevant here, where the SEC's proxy access rule permits shareholders to group together uh, to meet the 3% ownership requirement. And Craigslist uh, rescinded a pill. I don't think it's applicable here. I think Craigslist is a very particular case about a privately held company, and frankly, about a litigant who failed to, to, to properly assert uh, you know, danger to, to, to corporate value rather than sort of saying that uh, we're a California company, we don't care about, about money. Uh, that was just not a, not a defense, I think, that was workable in the Court of Chancery. So the question is, how will Delaware review these defenses? Uh, the applicable case, of course, is the Blasius case, which says that actions taken with the principal purpose to uh, infringe upon the shareholder franchise will require a compelling interest. That case has been applied as an outcome determinative test. So when the court says Blasius applies, it means you lose. It means defendant loses. Number one. Um, I'm not sure that all of my defenses really uh, implicate Blasius at all, because the, the effect will be incidental. The effect will be secondary, and it depends upon whether the board can articulate uh, you know, a justification for adoption uh, in, in addition and beyond uh, this defense. And that has, res that is, uh, that has been uh, an issue that has come up before, and that has, uh, I think, frankly, led to some defenses that have been permitted uh, that might not have otherwise survived Unical. Secondly, I think there is a distinct, a distinct difference between actions taken with a principal purpose to infringe upon the shareholder's right to vote or the shareholder's right to nominate and actions taken with the principal purpose to infringe upon a shareholder's right to nominate on the corporate proxy under the federal uh, proxy access nomination rule. A distinct difference. And so I think there's a viable argument there as well that Blasius wouldn't apply to actions taken with the sole purpose of defending against federal proxy access nominations. 
Um, I, you know, I don't think that you can argue that federal proxy access nominations are, in, are, are vital to the shareholders' ability to exercise the franchise because even now they don't have that right and they have not had that right uh, since, the, since the DGCL provisions, um, since the last major revision in 1967. So I think it, be, it would be pretty strange for Delaware to say that, uh, you know, proxy access nominations to the corporate proxy are vital to exercise of the franchise because Delaware didn't even amend its code to uh, 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 clear up whether shareholders had the right to adopt proxy access bylaws until just a couple of years ago. So I don't think that's vital to the franchise. And thirdly and finally, I think even if the court says that Blasius applies, I think that there's a demonstrable argument that the threat of, of, of costs from conflicted shareholder participation on the board represent the sort of compelling interests that uh, Chancellor Allen uh, was uh, focusing on in the Blasius case. In fact, I think there's an, uh, a, a very viable argument that um, the threat of minority representation on the board um, is actually worse than uh, the threat of a shareholder who's seeking to acquire control because they internalize far less of the costs of their, of their, of their potential conflicts, right? In fact, I, I would probably have, have felt a lot more comfortable with an SEC proxy access rule that said that you may use proxy access only if you uh, certify that you will make a tender offer for control of the company. Uh, as part of your, as part of what you use proxy access for, because I think, frankly, it represents the possibility of collusion. Right? I mean, it's a very simple story to tell. The union pension fund shareholders on the board, and uh, the company has a lot of union employees, and the board says, uh, "Don't give us a hard time about compensation, and we won't uh, downsize as much as we were planning to." Right? It's a very simple uh, and very easy, uh, uh, um, even Im implicit bargain uh, to make. Um, I think that we'll see that the, the Delaware courts need to divorce, uh, uh, just as a more global point, need to divorce uh, its interpretation of Blasius uh, from Unical. So traditionally, it's, it's only really been about acquisitions of control. And so Blasius and Unical, which is about reviewing uh, uh, you know, defenses to, 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 to offers, um, uh, they've traditionally been reviewed together because the proxy fight was really about the offer and uh, uh, the proxy fight was about um, obtaining control to rescind the poison pill. Um, but in this case, we'll see proxy fights that are not about that. And so we'll need to think about Blasius on its own terms. And I think we'll need to develop a more cogent uh, a review of Blasius as a result. So <coughs> finally, um, so if, uh, assuming these things survive Delaware, the, then, then the question is, but have they been preempted by the SEC, right? That's the big question. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. First of all, the SEC rule on its face purports to be respectful of state law, right? And it purports to actually only apply to the, to the proxy process. So what happens after the proxy process is done isn't part of the SEC's, uh, 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 you know, unless it's fraud or something, isn't part of the SEC's jurisdiction here. The SEC is not purporting to change uh, director of qualification bylaws. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this is accurate because it comes off of Brock Romanek's uh, corporatecouncil.net, but he has a quote from what he calls correspondence between the Division of Corporate Finance. Here's, here's what it says. Question of, uh, this comes from, Brock says, the Division of Corporate Finance, so correct me if, if Brock or I are wrong. The question of director qualifications is, from the staff's perspective, a slightly different animal. It's clear from the release that if the bylaws include reasonable director qualifications that relate to the nominee's ability to serve, then a nominee must be included in the proxy statement, even if they don't satisfy the, comp the qualifications. The company could, however, refuse to seat the director even if elected in compliance with Delaware or other state law. So uh, even the SEC doesn't purport to, to you know, preempt a, in that broad way. Even if you can point to some Del provision in the Delaware Code and say that is preempted by Dodd-Frank, uh, and the federal court could say you know, that, that law no longer applies, the board can say, okay, fine, then we'll just promulgate it pursuant to our broader authority under 141. And uh, there's no way that, that Dodd-Frank preempts you know, DGCL 141. Uh, so I don't think preemption really is, 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 is an issue. Um, and at the end of the day, I think the, the, the broader sort of global point I want to make is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm someone who's very concerned about the prospect of, you know, preemption of Delaware because then, um, you know, my, my time studying this stuff becomes useless if nothing else. Um, and I also have, you know, my own affection for Delaware just like my colleagues have for the commission. Um, and in fact, I have a question for the commission too. I just, I just want the commission not to step on Delaware's toes. But I'm not too worried because of this, because of the fact that Delaware's code is by its very essence an enabling one. And I think of SEC regulations as being 
relatively constrictive as being designed to constrict behavior. And I think as a general matter, it's very difficult for a constrictive code to preempt an enabling code. Delaware is, is, is like Muhammad Ali. I mean, you, you know, he'll take his licks, he'll move, he's very flexible, uh, he'll rope a dope, and then when you don't see him coming, he, he's got some, some, some move that you've never seen before. Uh, and so I think Delaware has a lot of uh, fight left in it. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Questions from the room? Mr. Langer? Uh, JW. Yeah. Hardly know where to begin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the phrase massive resistance jumped into my mind when you were talking. That's, that's what you're proposing here. And, and it strikes me that I think you proved the preemption point in your argument. Your whole paper is how to, how to defeat the intent behind a congressional enactment. I think, you know, federal court jurisprudence on preemption uh, essentially asks that question. Is this an effort to defeat a legitimate exercise of federal power? If so, yeah, I, I think the court has room to, to strike it down. Uh, but I guess my more nuanced point is your declaration is going to require the Delaware judiciary uh, to lead the fight. Uh, you say Glacius and that jurisprudence can be read in such a way to uphold um, the defenses you talk about. It can also be read the other way. Uh, and there is enough play in Delaware law. It can go either way. And I doubt that uh, the chancery judges or the Delaware Supreme Court really wants to pick this fight. Uh, in light of uh, the supremacy clause, I'm not sure they ought to pick this fight once Congress has spoken. But you know, ultimately, political winds change. Uh, I realize we may be going in a direction in which there would be a period of time in which if Delaware wanted to get aggressive about this, it could. But political winds will change again. And if you are not a believer in federalism, uh, if you believe that Delaware should not be able to stake too much out uh, immune from federal law, then were the Delaware judges to gain a reputation for massive resistance? Next time, the winds blow the other way. Uh, I think that the claim for an even greater uh, federalization, uh, which I would not support. I share a lot of your views about the, the virtues of federalism, but it's, it's got to be cooperative federalism, uh, not massive resistance. Yeah, well, first, as to the preemption point, uh, I just don't agree. I mean, I don't agree, first of all, that you can say that you've had uh, massive subject matter uh, preemption here, right? The rule is about nominations to the proxy process, and Delaware's not going to uh, stop nominations. They're, they're going to find ways to indirectly make it more expensive if they follow through with my suggestions. And making something more difficult is not the same thing as, as stopping it. And further, I think operationally, uh, you know, as the SEC admits in, in, the, in the latest, at least, uh, word from the Division of Corporate Finance on director qualification bylaws, which I think are, you know, you can say are about preemption. The SEC says, no, it, it, it doesn't preempt the proxy process. We won't, we won't allow you to not, uh, you know, put people on the proxy because you claim they're not qualified. It's just a question of, uh, you know, that the state law question would still remain and, and we don't, uh, you know, have a dog in that fight. Uh, uh, at that point. And, and further, I think even if a federal court, again, uh, you know, overturns some, some statute saying particularly that this is preempted, which I think is doubtful, I think at the same time, um, defenses that don't require a statute to go through, uh, you know, won't be preempted. They can point to the broad authority under 141. And if, you know, if making things more difficult was enough for preemption, then we'd, we would have seen uh, by this point, broader, pre, uh, you know, some attempted preemption of, of the Delaware anti-takeover statute, and we haven't. And I know Supermania thinks that we should, but we haven't, and I don't think that we will. I don't think that we will. But to the broader point of what's Delaware willing to do, um, I can't speak for the judges, but I can speak to interaction with the bar. And, um, you know, 
some of the bars say this is great and we like it and some of the bar uh, want to roll over and they say uh, no. In fact, a couple, of, you know, a couple of people in Delaware say you should shut up because you know, you're going to mess up the game for all of us. Uh, and that's fine, but a lot of Delaware lawyers really like these ideas, and uh, you know, I don't purport to speak for the judges either way. Um, but I do think there's lots of doctrinal room for, for dealing with this and, and for, and for uh, you know, allowing some of my defenses through. As I said, you know, two or three of them I think are very doubtful, but I think are worth considering as an academic matter. I think the two or three of them, particularly uh, you know, insurance, particularly director qualification bylaws, which were expressly permitted at the DGCL, uh, in, in denial of indemnification, subcommittee delegation, committee delegation, um, I, I think uh, are, are, are easily defensible under Blasius. Um, and I think I guess we just disagree on that. Um, I have a question. This is a little bit uh, getting into the mind of Congress, but uh, I wonder if, um, and I'm addressing David and Annette principally, but um, could you speak a little bit to the uh, justification for all of the studies that are in included in the statute? Um, in other words, why didn't, it, it, it appears that Congress was going to a goal with most of these studies. Um, it appears that the goals are pretty well explained in the act, um, and yet, you know, there's a requirement of studies rather than just the SEC shall issue rules. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. A study is the classic political compromise. It is um, uh, one group of people say this, another group of people say not this. There are... Um, um, uh, th there may be political pressures in terms of having to make a choice one way um, uh, or another. Um, you may not know what to do. It may be extremely complex. So you say, I'll tell you what, we're going to take a bold stand and say, those guys got to study it. Um, and I think um, <laughs> there, there, there are a lot Given the comprehensive nature of the statute and the and the um, complexity of the issues, there are a lot of them where either politically or purely substantively, uh, uh, the the right answer is not entirely clear. And Congress said, "You guys think about it before we have to deal with the political problem of which side uh, do we jump." Yeah, I, I agree. I'm you know, it's been referred to as kicking the can. I mean, in some instances, um, they couldn't reach consensus, and so they said, let's study it. Um, and, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of what comes out really depends on uh, how prescriptive the questions are uh, in terms of what the study is supposed to address. I mean, you see, for instance, um, you know, there's a, there's a study on whether or not uh, FX swaps, foreign exchange swaps, should be regulated as swaps and should go through clearing houses and the like. And um, there are a whole series of questions that have to be answered, including questions like, uh, will it be dangerous to the financial system to regulate FX swaps and swaps? I mean, you know, so it, people then, you, you, they not only kick the can by agreeing to do a study, but then people load on with, you know, one says, you know, will this, will this benefit society and cure cancer? And then the other question is, you know, will this cause the financial system to come to a complete stop? All of which they just, you know, impose on the poor regulators to make sense of, and in many cases in six months, along with, you know, the other hundreds of rulemakings that they're doing. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. It'll be interesting to see in some of these instances what will come of it. For instance, I think on the Volcker rule, I mean, that's a study that I think people are taking pretty seriously because um, it required the Financial Stability Oversight Council to sort of study various questions around the Volcker rule. And the thought is that however they come out on that study could influence ultimately what um, the regulators determine is going to be, you know, the real contours of what's in and what's out of, the, you know, Volcker. So some of them are, some of them are far more important than others. And uh, the SEC is supposed to be looking at efficiency, competition, and impact on capital formation with respect to most of this rulemaking. What, how is that 
uh, implemented? How is that directive Im implemented by the SEC? Um, we have um, economists and um, uh, we um, have um, uh, organized uh, uh, that effort. One of the things that um, the chairman has tried to do for the last year and a half is m integrate more closely economic analysis into um, in, in, into the uh, routine rulemaking process. Now, there's a problem here. We, we have to do a ton of stuff, and we have to do it very quickly. Um, and I can't say for sure that um, we would we, we will do this all with the same thoroughness that we would do it if we didn't have to do it quickly. And we're swamped. I mean, there's just no question about that. Um, and uh, I don't yet know how vulnerable this will make us on, a, on, on appeal uh, if folks want to uh, appeal our rules. I mean, the argument would be there's nothing in the Dodd-Frank Act that repealed these other provisions of the securities laws that require us to consider these matters. Um, and uh, the, the time, um, the deadlines in the statutes don't say the SEC shall uh, promulgate inadequately considered rules <laughs> within uh, 180 <laughs> days. So that's the argument on that side. Um, on the other side, I think the argument is, well, yes, that's all true as a technical matter, but in deciding, directing us to do things within a certain um, a number of days, Congress plainly thought that there was urgency to our doing it, and Congress um, itself, it's a legislative judgment in effect to weigh what you might do if you did it quickly with the importance of doing it quickly. And so um, that should be taken into account by us and by a reviewing court in formulating a rule. George is behind me. How do the panelists handicap the uh, challenge by the Business Roundtable and the Chamber of Commerce to the <laughs> shareholder access rules, uh, largely on the grounds that they invite hijacking by unions and pension funds? Um, George, I'm the Commission's lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm not going to say anything other than what I truly believe, which is you know, we'll leave it um, to the courts, but I'm, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic. Um, I, I um, am kind of conflicted in part on that because um, on the one hand, I want to be an advocate for Delaware to the extent I think it's ideologically defensible and, and empirically defensible, but on the other hand, if they strike it down, then, then, then nobody's going to want to read this anymore because <laughs> it'll, be pre it'll be useless. Um, but uh, it's tough to say. I think uh, you know the, the chamber obviously has a good uh, record against the commission. I think they're like four zero at this point in the, in the business roundtable. And but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, you no longer have the challenge of whether or not you had the authority to do so. You have to, the challenge of whether or not you had the empirical basis to do so. And uh, they signed to lots of studies. It's a question whether or not that's enough. Uh, I think the odds are probably lower than some of the other challenges, like the odds of the. I would have handicapped the Goldstein challenge in advance a lot higher than I would this one. Um, but at the same time, I think at the end of the day, like with most things, it's going to depend on who's on the panel. Yeah, I agree. Look, I think you know, Congress clearly evidenced an intention to, uh, <coughs> to have the commission you know, put a proxy access rule in place. Um, so that has to be very helpful, as was said, on the authority side. So now you're getting down to technical APA issues, and I think the commission, you know, did everything that it could to, um, you know, to justify its actions, and uh, 
it really does go to the panel. I mean, we, I think the commission has, you know, come across panels who say, prove to me, you know, show me the empirical evidence of, you know, why regulation is necessary. And it's like saying, prove to me why you need insurance for your house because the evidence shows that the likelihood of there being a fire is very low. I mean, if you set the bar certain ways, it's going to be very difficult for the commission to justify almost any action. And so a lot of it really just depends on, you know, what are, what are the standards that are being imposed by the reviewers? Um, what I would point out that one of the challenges is also on the federalism question uh, in that uh, petition. And I wonder if, uh, if any of you have considered whether uh, the court is likely to reach that issue. I'm, I'm not in the predicting not business not with yeah. respect to <laughs> this case in this no. court. Yeah. I will say this. I think the First Amendment challenge, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but I think that's one of those red herrings that you just sort of throw in there. Mm. Yeah. We had a question here. question it's it's I guess it relates a little to what you were saying about um, in response to the question on the cost-benefit kinds of studies but I was wondering an alternative sort of explanation for the enforcement failure would not be revolving door but it would be the agencies for a long time has always been focused on on equity and it's very lawyer based and it really all of the financial crisis and the issues were in fixed income. That's where all of sort of what was going on in the banks and like, and the agency really hadn't focused on that because not why would you? You're basically were focused on stock. And so the staff was developed and the expertise or the skills was to understand the equity market and not fixed income. And so there's a lot of people who are going to be hired by or we expect to sort of uh, for the agency's new responsibilities. Um, and so I'm wondering if you think that um, one direction might be sort of not integrating sort of the, I guess, the risk management with the rulemaking, but actually with enforcement. Should there be more, so should it all be as many lawyers or should we be bringing in financial economists and economists? Like the, for instance, if we look at sort of antitrust, right, then there the lawyers uh, will bring their cases. Of course, that's partly because of the way the legal rules work. You have to figure out what's the market and so the economists in the antitrust division go over with the cases. Can you bring a case or not? Do you think that would be something that would be um, better for the enforcement in bringing in that in the agency. If we're gonna, you know, I guess what is there like a thousand more employees or some large number of employees will have to be brought in to sort of um, enforce or implement rules. But what about the in enforcement? Right, would that help? Um, would you think that was sort of the I'm thinking of the Madoff case, right? Okay, some you know the guy's original letter. Okay, we could think he was crazy. A lot of it was written as a cra uh, crazy person would write it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, <laughs> there's certain kinds of aspects about that that maybe not lawyers, but people in the business would say, you know, there are weird things about how to get this return and to look at the strategies. Um, no one could think those strategies he was using could have produced the returns as consistently. That's not something that the lawyers would know, but that might be something that better integration with um, having more financial economists or people like that in the agency and the enforcement. Would there's, a, um, there's a lot to uh, respond to in, in that question. Um, I, I will say that the view of the enforcement division has changed rapidly over a short period of time, and a lot of it depends on whom you talk to. Uh, you hang around with the defense bar, and what they will tell you and um, is how unreasonable the SEC is, how it brings all these crappy cases and a bunch of bullies and ideologues and all that. Um, uh, on Madoff, um, uh, I, my sense is, is that if you think that what you're looking for is a Ponzi scheme, it's not that difficult to find. Um, and, um, Uh, the demonstration that, and, and, I, and I'm just now r really reading from the uh, IG's report, I, I, I think the people on the enforcement staff and the inspection staff accepted the notion that Madoff couldn't have been making the returns that he claimed to have made. Um, and I don't think having more economists on that point would have changed their thinking. It, it was 
Notwithstanding that, and, and, and this is inexplicable to me except for the fact I, I believe it was inconceivable. Um, notwithstanding that, they didn't say, well, this must be a Ponzi scheme, and to do a Ponzi scheme, you got to look at this and this and this and this. Now, having said all that, we do have a new Office of Market Intelligence within enforcement, and we do now have new techniques to compare claimed returns with averages sliced and dice certain ways. And we are trying to get these um, um, uh, more sort of market-based folks um, in there to be reviewing things to determine, you know, should we be looking at this? And so, you know, bottom line, I very much agree with your point. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I think even given what, given the structure of the SEC before, and, and before they brought in more of these financial economists and the like, um, I think there were problems with how these um, whistleblowing letters or whatever were even processed. So I think it, um, they were not sort of widely enough dispersed that I don't think you saw, it, they didn't even go to places in the agency where there may have been people who sort of understood it a little more. So it, I don't think it was a fixed income issue. I think in some of it, there was, there were, um, he was saying he was making all of his um, returns on the options markets. Yeah, but a lot of it was like options trading. Yeah. And you look at what he said he was doing, and he apparently said he was doing this massive amount of uh, trading and options. And then the staff apparently went to the uh, uh, Options Clearing Corp to look at the activity, and there wasn't any. And so apparently he said, well, that's because I did it all in London. Well, with all due respect, there were a lot of people in that building who knew that you could not possibly have done all that trading in London. So I, I think it's a question of not just having the right people there, and I do think they, they benefit tremendously from having people who understand this activity a lot better and, and from getting financial economists and the like. But it's also a question of, you know, how do these things get better? And, you know, the challenge is, as you, as you indicated, you know, you look at it at first blush, it doesn't seem to have credibility. I, I don't know how many of those kinds of letters the SEC gets, but I suspect it's in the thousands. And so the challenge is, you know, what do you do with that? Here, unfortunately, I think I can understand in the first instance not taking it seriously, but as you, as time went on, I think there were some signs that uh, I don't, I have to believe that wouldn't happen again. I think we're out of time, but thank you all very much.